Okay, I have a weird question. What does home sound like to you? If you're a city goer, for example, maybe it's the hum of traffic or the occasional blare of ambulance sirens. If you're like me and you live near the ocean, home could sound like waves or even some seagulls or the local ferry leaving port. Whatever it is, the sum of those sounds may be comforting to us. We're in a familiar and hopefully safe place. And it turns out the same could be said for corals. I'm Danny Hens from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Right now, you're listening to the percussive sounds of a healthy coral reef. You're hearing the static crackle of snapping shrimp and those croaks. Yeah, those are fish. This is what marine scientists think a healthy coral reef should sound like. Loud, dynamic, and full of life. Because when it does, it may be attracting these free-swimming baby corals called larvae. Yes, you heard right. Corals may be able to hear. And so today, we're going to talk about why sound is important for new corals to find a place to call home, what happens when that sound isn't there, and how scientists can use that information to help restore coral reefs. Corals obviously don't have big ears like we do or your, your puppy dog might. That's Aaron Mooney, a sensory biologist here at the institution. He and his lab have been spending years flying down to the U.S. Virgin Islands to record, sift through, and compare the sounds of healthy and sick reefs. We were interested in corals in particular because they're this foundational species, right? They literally create the foundation for a reef. And so the fact that they um, detect and respond and can settle or get attracted by sound is really important because that's how we can kind of help rebuild that reef. Okay, before we can get into what sounds baby corals are attracted to, you need to understand a few things about their life cycle. One of the main ways corals reproduce is through a process called spawning. Some coral basically put sperm into the water column and some coral put eggs into the water column. They mix and fertilize to become this free-floating coral called a larvae. So there's sort of this ball of hairy cells, kind of like a tennis ball, kind of floating around in the ocean in the middle of the water column. Pretty immediately after that, they start looking for a place to settle. They do take hours to days to get ready to come back and settle. And then when they find that right spot, they're able to kind of depth regulate. So they're able to kind of swim downward. Oh, and did I mention these guys are really small, like seriously small. They're like the size of a a grain of sand. At that size, they're incredibly vulnerable. They can be sucked out to sea by nearby currents or worse, eaten. Any of those sort of like predator reef fish, so it could even be like damselfish or squirrelfish, but at those younger stages, um, they would love a nice coral larvae snack. Once these larvae pick a spot, they attach for life. That means they need to choose wisely, which is really hard to do when you can't see and you have predators after you. So they have to use other cues to help guide them to that perfect spot. One is reacting to chemicals or hormones in the seawater. And the more recently discovered cue is, say it with me, sound. There was a science paper out that basically showed that coral larvae will move towards sound. So if you play a nice uh, sort of healthy reef sound, the larvae will swim towards it. And that's what's called phonotaxis. Um, So phono meaning sound and taxis meaning movement. So moving towards that sound. Remember those tiny hairs that Aaron was talking about? Well, it's thought that those may help coral larvae sense vibrations produced in the water column. Just like we have hair cells on our on your arm or even in your inner ear, and so that might be how they detect sound. Um, and they also probably have a balance organ as well. So just like our inner ear is also a balance organ, right? Right. If you get a really bad ear infection, your balance might be thrown off, and that might also function to detect sound. Exactly what sound or combination of sounds coral larvae are attracted to is what Aaron and his lab are trying to figure out. I wanted to learn more about how they were researching these sounds, so I took a trip down to the U.S. Virgin Islands and met up with one of the Ph.D. students working in Aaron's lab. My name is Nadej Aoki. I'm a second-year graduate student at Hui. Nadej is a sensory biologist who has spent the past two years going to the Virgin Islands. 
She's been setting up these underwater microphones called hydrophones and listening to the collected playback. If I open up a file and listen to it, I can kind of identify, yeah, that sort of collection of sounds is likely to be um, this type of reef or a slightly healthier or less degraded one. For now, healthy means more life on a reef. More life means more fish and more fish calls. As to kind of how far they can hear it, specifically what types of sounds or what components of the soundscape are most valuable, we really have no idea yet. After sifting through hours of acoustic data, sometimes recorded over the course of months, she says she's gotten quite familiar with a few characters. Characters like the damselfish. She even knows the specific frequencies of some animals, like a cusk eel call. It almost sounds like an engine or something. It's kind of like a noise around one kilohertz. These hydrophones are recording up to two and a half hours a day, sometimes for months at a time. So listening can be a tall order, especially on more active reefs like this one reef in St. John called Tektite. On a reef like Tektite, which is one of the healthier ones, a one minute recording will have like, you know, a few dozen different overlapping fish calls at like almost any time of day. It's a lot harder to identify uh, the fish that are making those calls than it is sometimes to identify a bird call. Still, Nadej doesn't seem to mind. What I find fascinating about sensory biology and sensory ecology is trying to put yourself in the perspective of an organism that has a completely different perception of the world than you. The problem is most of the reefs, including some of the ones that Nadej is studying in the Virgin Islands, are dying. And with them, the fishy chorus of the reef. That puts a strain on research, but more importantly on an ecosystem that globally supports 25% of ocean life. You can get a sense of it just from listening to the soundscape that it's just quieter. The those sort of snap, dominant snapping shrimp calls, I think, are really um, much more obvious. It's the difference between this and this. It's like walking through a forest when you like stop and listen and you hear the birds chirping and the like frogs riveting underneath and you kind of can hear this whole buzz, then if that went away, it would be very eerie and very unnerving for somebody, you know, it would feel like a horror movie. It's sort of hard to teach the newcomers to the island how much degradation there has been in your lifetime. While we were there, our boat operator, Glenn Harmon, told us he's been working in the U.S. Virgin Islands for more than 20 years, spending much of that time as a snorkel guide and a team leader for an environmental group called CORE. Which stands for Caribbean Oceanic uh, Research and Education. He could probably name you every coral around the island. There's a pillar coral. Uh, they call, we call it a D-sill and looks like a pipe organ, like a, you know, just a cathedral Another one, pipes. there's a maize coral, Meandrites, which just has an amazing shape. The roof the, in between the, in the structure, often a really beautiful green uh, there's a or species purple. in Otter Creek, right in the middle of the, the, the Hurricane Hole National Monument there. That's it's probably three feet across. Glenn's been working with CORE to stop the spread of a deadly marine illness called stony coral tissue loss disease, which has impacted over 30 different species of coral. Even in the past five years, um, areas that were what I would say pretty healthy coral are now tending towards more algae, dead coral that looks like rocks, much less fish. Um, yeah, just in general, the, the reef is less colorful. When Glenn's not topside, he's snorkeling or diving, sometimes using underwater scooters that help him zoom along the reef. While he's doing that, he's stopping and applying amoxicillin paste to stop the spread of this disease. Unfortunately, overfishing and warming are making it harder for him to keep up. They're dying faster than we can save them. And now I'm getting better at recognizing, oh, that's not a rock. Three months, six months ago, that was a brain coral. I know what you're thinking. Things seem pretty bleak for corals, but there may be hope. 
by playing pre-recorded healthy sounds through underwater speakers, Nadej and Aaron think they may actually be able to attract corals back to reefs that may have gone quiet. I mean, we're doing this essentially with the hope that this could be um, like helpful as a restoration method. That's Nadej again. Basically, you can play audio overnight um, in order to try to um, amplify or kind of enhance the local soundscape. This summer, Nadej plans on returning to St. John to run the first tests of this sonic therapy. And we're going to test that by bringing in some corals around their spawning cycle and uh, collecting their larvae when they spawn in the lab, putting them out at different distances from that speaker and seeing how they settle in response to acoustic playback versus no acoustic playback. If it works, Nadej says this could be an efficient restoration tool for future use. You could hand this to somebody at a hotel resort or something and say, hey, if you put this out on the moon on your reef, you might be able to attract more coral um, larvae to your reef. So if you want to build a build a car, you can't just do it with one wrench, right? You need you need a variety of wrenches and drills and all that sorts of thing. That's Aaron again from earlier in the story. We need a suite of ways to kind of rebuild and repair our reefs, and and we think bringing back the larvae, attracting larvae with sound, is one hopefully one of the key tools. He says the team is trying to ramp up their research in response to reef degradation. Soon, that may mean incorporating underwater autonomous vehicles that can use cameras and hydrophones together which may give researchers a more complete picture of where sounds are coming from on a reef. There's greater realization right now that reefs are imperiled. And so they're both in terms of federal funding and private philanthropy, there's greater interest in in solution-based science to those reefs. Until those robots are ready, he and Nadej and the team will have to continue doing the tireless work of cataloging reef sounds, getting ever closer to figuring out the true song corals are listening for. So we think, you know, this is the future. Let's really keep an eye on on these iconic corals like that to, to do everything we can to keep them alive. The idea of that all going silent, it doesn't seem peaceful. It doesn't seem reassuring to me. It's, you know, that's a cause for concern. I think we want the ocean to be, to be like loud in a healthy way. Today's episode was produced and hosted by me, Danny Hentz. Music is by Ian Post, Maya Belsitzman, and Matan Efrat from Artless.io. You can learn more about corals and reef research in our latest issue of Oceanus Magazine. Subscribe by going to go.hui.edu slash Oceanus.